Yeah, just to reiterate, my name's Clinton. We're here to talk about Kubernetes. Welcome, everybody. Um, so, a few different ways I want to party today. First of all, what is Kubernetes? It's a buzzword that's going around a lot. What does it actually mean? What does it have to do with Drupal? Why or why would I not want to run Drupal on Kubernetes versus any of the other options? Uh, and while we're at it, you know, what is a container? I know some people might still be a little hazy on the differentiation there. So we'll talk a little bit about containerization, service-oriented architecture, and then move into a discussion of where does Kubernetes kind of fit in? What can it really do to supercharge my Drupal site? Um, and then how do we think about Drupal in a service-oriented way, right? Given that it is a legacy kind of monolithic application designed way before the cloud, way before containers, way before Docker, anything like that. You know, what does it take to actually reconceptualize the way we think about something like Drupal in a way that allows us to run it on a, you know, contemporary uh, container orchestration platform like Kubernetes? Um, and then what does that mean in a practical level, right? Like what do we have to do on the Drupal side to really get a build and deploy workflow that is compatible with a container orchestration solution for hosting your Drupal site? Uh, and then finally we'll nerd out a little bit and actually look at some code and, and get down and dirty in the weeds. So again, hopefully I uh, won't keep anybody too long. But again, a lot of this gets a little bit dense, especially if you're kind of new to containers, Kubernetes, things like that. So please, if I lose anybody, don't hesitate, you know, shoot the hand up. We can do questions kind of as we go rather than, you know, saving them all to the end. So please don't be shy. All right. First of all, burning question in everyone's mind, you know, what is Kubernetes? Why should I care about it? Um, First, though, I think we kind of have to take maybe a half step back from that and talk about Docker and talk about containers. Um, do you want to get like a quick show of hands? Who at least has some familiarity with like what a container is? Um, okay, great. Then we can kind of you know speed through the first part of this. Uh, hopefully, not you know do too much reiteration for people who have been through this before. Um, I think what it ultimately comes down to is changing the conceptual framework that we have of Drupal as being an application that runs on a server and talk about it as a collection of services. Um, so what do we mean by that, right? Typically we think of Drupal and just kind of monolithic web applications in general as running on a machine, right, that we connect to, we make requests, it returns web pages back to the browser, right? Uh, and that machine is comprised of an operating system, the monolithic application itself, all of the dependencies and libraries that make it up, right? Uh, and this, you know, was the case for most of Drupal's life cycle. I've been working with Drupal since 2005, version roughly 4.1, going into 4.2, which was a big upgrade at the time. Uh, and this was really before even the days of virtualization, right? So to deploy your Drupal site, you FTP'd into your physical machine, which was like co-located in a data center, if you were lucky. If not, it was like a, a tower under somebody's desk. And you FTP'd all your files, and then you hoped that nothing broke, because there was no such thing as like a staging environment, right? Um, and because, you know, Drupal is a stateful application, it relies on this big honking MySQL database behind everything that's driving all those connections, storing all of those content. Um, that model has always made Drupal, you know, scaling kind of messy, right? Even once we move forward to the days of VMs, even in the, the days of the cloud starting, you know, roughly 10 years or so ago, um, you still have the situation where, like, to scale Drupal, you have to bring up a bunch of EC2 instances, put them behind a load balancer, make sure your database can scale vertically to keep up with the horizontal scaling of your machine layer, and then you've got to worry about things like operating system patching, making sure the same damn PHP version is running on all those machines, right? Ensuring that if a machine falls out of the load balancer that you're going to be able to fail gracefully and so forth and so on. Um, and honestly, like, that's what I've been doing most of my career, and I find it to be a bit of a headache, right? So I'm sort of constantly looking for, for not shortcuts necessarily, but ways into the future that we can take this sort of aging monolith that is Drupal and bring it into the contemporary, you know, DevOps, cloudified, containerized world. Um, so what does that world look like, right? What a modern service-oriented architecture, uh, you know, looks like and the way we sort of have to conceive of it is getting rid of that whole idea that the server is something that is like one thing that exists, you know, off even in a data center or off in the cloud. And conceive of your application as a, collect a collection of services, right, that do one particular thing, that do it well, and that don't do anything more than that, and that communicate among themselves to give you the response that you need after you make that request from the browser, right? Each of those services runs inside a container. And that container only holds what is needed to run that service and all of its dependencies, right? Everything down to essentially the kernel level. Once you get down to the kernel level, all of those containers share the same kernel that happens to be running on the, the virtual machine. 
Um, but the idea is that you can abstract away from that, right? We no longer have to think in terms of like, well, how many machines is going to be necessary to run this Drupal application? Uh, how many, you know, what, how many layers of load balancing do I have to put behind it? How beefy does this infrastructure have to be? And we can talk about it more in terms of like, how many resources does this service require? And then let an orchestration platform kind of, you know, think about everything else and do all the hard work. So the idea is that if you incorporate these abstractions and you change your conceptual framework of how Drupal is kind of fundamentally organized, you can allow all of that infrastructure scaling to happen without knowing anything about the application state, right? Like ultimately it doesn't matter if you're running Drupal or WordPress, WordPress or Node.js app or heaven forbid Ruby on Rails, right? All that matters is you've got these services that do one discrete thing, you know that they're in containers that can handle all of their internal dependencies, and so all you need to worry about is sort of like what are the resource needs for each one and how do they fit together? You've probably seen this before. This is kind of the quintessential model, that literally from the Docker site, of a containerized model versus a, a, a VM model, right? So on the right, kind of in a traditional setup, you've got your infrastructure, your actual hardware at the bottom. Then you have a hypervisor, right? And that can either be something like a KVM, um, you know, VMware, et cetera, that is actually organizing the underlying hardware. And then for each VM, you're running an entire operating system stack, as well as all of the dependencies to run a given application, right? And in this sense, these apps are like monoliths. So it's everything you need to run Drupal, everything you need to run your giant job application, et cetera. Um, obviously, one of the big drawbacks here is this is super inefficient in terms of resource utilization, right? Because you've got separate kernels running all of these machines. They're hogging tons of memory. They're all doing their own logging, et cetera, et cetera. You move over to the left-hand side, the containerization model um, runs a single operating system on top of a unit of compute power, whether that's a VM, uh, a piece of hardware, et cetera. And then you've got the Docker container runtime you know, sitting on top of that. And that container runtime is what's handling all of the resource allocation to your various containers, which means that no matter what's running in them, all you need to know is like how much juice to give a particular service Docker handles all of that, and you don't have to worry about installing libraries on your machine, keeping them up to date, patching the operating system, et cetera. Um, so obviously this allows a lot greater density in terms of how much you can run on a given bit of hardware, and it allows a lot more flexibility in terms of you know, making your applications portable um, and allowing them to do a lot more given you know, a certain amount of hardware. Um, again, as we were saying, benefits of containerization, speed, you, know, you get multiple containers running on the same host operating system, Yep, go ahead. I actually wanted to ask a question quickly on the last slide. Sure. Just to kind of make a connection. This is not exactly the same thing that you're saying, but it's a way of conceptualizing this. Because you're talking about understanding services and service-oriented architecture. And another trend that I think I'm seeing when you're talking about service-oriented architecture is that people even trying to build server-less applications mm -hmm. and kind of going to this idea of, for instance, like Lambda functions right. and, and these things here. So when I'm looking at these apps that are in there, I'm sort of almost thinking of them in terms of like, you know, this app is sort of like one of your, mm -hmm. again, just an analogy. Like, this is sort of like a Lambda function there. And then you see, like all of this stuff is sitting on top of the one thing here. So each of the apps are sort of like their own thing. So does that make sense to think of it in that in way at all about like, oh, this is like a, serverless and that sort of like a lambda function? Or? Yeah, no, I think so. Yeah, the question is for the benefit of the recording is um, what are the similarities between the sort of containerized model and something like a serverless environment like a lambda function? And I think you can think of it similarly in that both are abstractions away from the idea of a machine, right? Like when you're running a lambda function, uh, you don't really care about what uh, literal VM or literal physical machine it's running on, right? All you care about is that you need a certain amount of resources for, you know, available to that function in real time to be able to run it. Um, I think the benefit though that you get from a containerized based concept rather than something that's specific to a single cloud provider is that portability, right? That anything you can run in a container doesn't have to be a Node.js runtime, right? It doesn't have to be any of the you know, very specific runtime models that are available for that cloud provider. Anything that essentially runs on Linux or Windows you can put into a container, package it with all its dependencies, and it'll run on any container runtime, right? Which are available for like all the major cloud providers. You can run containers on your own physical hardware if you want. And so I think it's maybe a more open source way of thinking about it as opposed to kind of locking yourself into a single you know, provider. But conceptually it's similar. The idea here is how can we abstract away from the hardware, not care about what it's running on underneath, and only think about what do I need to run my application, right? Um, 
So yeah, ultimately that's the third point here is this portability, right? So containers work the same way everywhere, right? It doesn't matter what the hardware is, it doesn't matter what the VM stack is, what the underlying operating system is. If the hardware can, you know, or, or the, if the compute resources, to abstract it even further, can run the Docker runtime, any container can run on them. And that means you can have multi-cloud deployments, you can have failover between cloud providers. If all of AWS goes down, AWS East goes down, and you've got a hot spare on running on an Azure environment and some fancy DNS, you can have zero downtime, you know, failing over from one to the other, because everything is the same from the container level down. Um, and it allows seamless migrations across the infrastructure, right? You can even do like zero downtime migration of containers from one Kubernetes cluster to another. Um, and again, we talked a little bit about agility. Since containers package their own dependencies, uh, you eliminate this problem of like a developer saying, well, it works locally. I don't know why it's not working in production, right? Because the idea here is you run the exact same containers on every environment, so you eliminate those disparities. And if you have to upgrade from PHP you know, 7.3.5 to 7.3.6, you do that as part of a release cycle that goes through your local dev stage production workflow. Uh, and again, we already talked about speed, allowing much more efficient you know, resource utilization uh, to the underlying hardware. So where does Kubernetes come into this picture, right? But like Docker sounds great, we agree that maybe we run everything in containers, they're portable, they're fast, etc. cetera. Uh, so Kubernetes, which is abbreviated KS, you'll kind of see that <coughs> sprinkled throughout just for space concerns. Um, it's an open source container orchestration engine, right? And this grew out of the Google Cloud uh, platform, essentially, before that was released and they, they sort of got into the cloud market. Uh, it began as an internal project to run Google applications kind of on a standardized model, right? It is originally called Project Borg. Uh, and if you think about anybody who's familiar with Star Trek The Next Generation, the Borg ship is a cube, right? And it's made of smaller cubes that all fit together in a certain configuration. So each of those cubes has within it everything that the board ship needs to run, right? It's got like the, the fuel and the engine and the life support, et cetera, and it can fit together with others and create bigger and bigger ships. But that means there's no single point of failure, right? You can't destroy a board ship because all it does is break into other cubes which form into larger cubes. So the idea here, and, and this is part of the, the, the pun within the name Kubernetes, right, is that it's this very flexible kind of um, modular architecture uh, it also uh, means navigator in Greek, apparently. I only recently learned that when, when researching uh, for, for this talk. Um, but the idea is that it provides this abstraction layer on top of arbitrary compute and storage resources, right? So your containers don't need to know about what's running underneath. Again, that could be literally running on bare metal, that could be running on a series of VMs, it could be running on some, you know, further abstraction layer that's connecting parts of different cloud providers together, et cetera. You can run it on your phone for all that matter. Um, and the idea is that it allows per container resource allocation across the entire cluster. So you combine all these resources together, I've got you know, a laptop and a phone and 16 different cloud providers. All Kubernetes cares about is what is my total amount of resources in terms of CPU, RAM, available storage, and then it allocates them to the containers running on the cluster. Right? And it does that as best it can, it does that in a loosely coupled way, and it does it without you really having to worry about the state of the application, right? So if a machine that's connected to a Kubernetes cluster goes down, all that means is the underlying amount of hardware resources decreases, and Kubernetes will intelligently figure out where to move those containers around to allow the cluster to remain up and running. So this like immediately removes a ton of headache for like your SREs or your DevOps people, right? Who are no longer like staring at metrics of EC2 instances, wondering when the next one's gonna die, how many do they have to scale up, how many auto-scaling rules do you have to tune to allow that to happen, right? Kubernetes can sort of handle all of that because again, it doesn't care about what's running inside the containers. It just knows that there are X number of them and they need this you know, amount of resource to, to perform their function. Um, it handles a lot of other stuff under the, the hood though, right? It handles all intra-container networking, so any communication that needs to happen within services in your application, Kubernetes does all that out of the box. Uh, all connections to the outside world, but more importantly, you know, because it does that, it's also by definition managing what's not connected to the outside world, right? So the way you do that is you define ingress rules which say make this service available on this port and nothing else so that nobody can come in and connect directly to your MySQL database, right? It's not so, like a resource that's existing off on the internet on its own machine available to anyone. It's a service running within the cluster and Kubernetes knows that only the web service, for example, is available um, on an ingress port. 
And then, as we were saying, underlying resources and scheduling of containers across the cluster to ensure high availability. Um, and then finally, it handles deploying container images into a cluster and defining rules for how pods are deployed. So we'll get to pods in just a second here. But the idea being, if I want to push my application into a Kubernetes cluster, I simply define what container image and what tag. So I might have version 2.1 of a particular service. I'm upgrading to 2.2. I tell it where to find that container image. I tell it which tag to pull. And then Kubernetes will intelligently go out grab the image, and then based on the rules I define, either do a rolling deployment so that I have zero downtime and simply pushing that container image out to all the active pods, uh, or it can you know, upgrade them all at once if I'm uh, you know, okay with a little bit of downtime, if I've scheduled a maintenance window, et cetera. Again, all that happens sort of out of the box without tooling. Um, but what makes it special, right? Like there are different ways to orchestrate containers. There's like ECS on Amazon, and you know you can run Docker Compose and things like that. What like you know what's the special sauce that that lets uh, Kubernetes kind of um, really be the uh, the champion in this space? Um, what I like about it just as a, an engineer is that everything within Kubernetes is declarative syntax, right? And it's all in YAML files. You don't have to worry about writing scripts or weird DSLs that use curly braces in various ways, you know, closure rules and things like that. You're not writing like Java functions to hook into various parts of the, the cluster. Everything is literally defining the state of the cluster as you want it in a YAML file using like plain, you know, declarative syntax, x equals y, key value store. Um, and Kubernetes simply does whatever it needs to do to make the state of the cluster match the desired state. So you use a tool called kubectl, uh, which essentially deploys a configuration in the form of a YAML file out to the Kubernetes cluster. And everything in Kubernetes is what's called a resource primitive, right? So we'll go through what some of those are. But everything from an individual uh, pod which runs a container, an ingress rule, a configuration set, um, you know, anything that you would need to make your application run is all defined in a separate YAML file. And you simply use the kubectl command to push it out to the cluster. And, that's in, you know, then, and Kubernetes does whatever it needs to do to make that happen. Um, there's also a really powerful system of labeling uh, and selectors, so you can define the relationships between resources within Kubernetes by saying, all of these resources belong to this application, so like this is my, my Drupal site app, you know, and that involves this service, this pod, this ingress. Um, but if I want to run, say, a dev and staging instance alongside each other in the same cluster, I can do that by defining this is the environment tier that these all belong to. So everything is addressable by this arbitrary system of labels, much like kind of Drupal tagging um, of nodes works, right? It's sort of a many-to-many -many relationship. Um, and then finally, it, it separates namespaces so that within an individual Kubernetes cluster, you can have kind of walled gardens to say like, this is everything from this department and this is you know, all, all the applications and services from another department, and then there's no network traffic allowed in between them. The services within a particular namespace can all communicate with each other, but not outside the namespace. Um, and finally, as we were saying, everything in Kubernetes is loosely coupled to each other, meaning there are no single points of failure. There is a uh, Kubernetes control plane, but it is shared uh, across all the nodes in a cluster. So that if a single machine goes down, Kubernetes doesn't lose its state. It simply nominates a new master and everything you know, continues moving forward. You don't have to worry that the master machine is, is going to die and the cluster doesn't know what to do with itself. And it's all self-healing under the hood. So again, eliminating headaches for, for your SREs. Um, so I've, I've kind of gone over a little bit of this already, but I think some vocabulary, you know, might, might be helpful throughout the kind of rest of this talk. This is where it gets a little bit dense. I'm going to try to push through it, but again, if there's any kind of questions, please don't be shy about them. Um, one confusing thing is this word node is used in a totally different way in Kubernetes than we might use it in the Drupal community. A node in Kubernetes is simply a discrete unit of computing power that is part of the cluster, right? So this might be like a VM a physical server, you know, an IoT device, anything that's providing like CPU and RAM resources um, that Kubernetes can schedule its, its pods on, right? Um, and, and this is the part that you don't have to think about as somebody who's using Kubernetes to deploy an application. The nodes are sort of totally abstracted away. All that really matters is that the totality of RAM and CPU provided by all the nodes in a cluster is enough to run the applications uh, and the services that you're deploying to it. Um, and then we've mentioned this a couple times, the idea of a pod. This is where, I, I don't know, uh, you, you can think of a pod as an instance of a running container. Um, 
And the idea is that, you know, uh, the Kubernetes will schedule as many pods as is needed to support the traffic going to that particular service. So if I've got a MySQL container, which we'll look at a little bit later as part of my Drupal application, um, and I'm running, say, three different nodes uh, in my Kubernetes cluster, but I'm pushing a bunch of queries to that MySQL database, and it's starting to re reach its resource limit, what Kubernetes will do is intelligently say, oh, I need a new pod for that container, and it'll schedule a new one on a different node in the cluster. So I don't have to think about that, right? I don't have to know how many pods are available, but just think of a pod as sort of a a container around a container, frankly, or the, the sort of underlying unit that Kubernetes is using to move its containers around on the underlying nodes. You, you can also schedule like multiple containers within a pod, but I think that's a little bit kind of advanced uh, woo stuff for this particular talk. Um, and then finally, a service, which uh, we also alluded to. And this is the idea that um, it is a way in or it is an access point into your application for providing a particular bit of functionality on a particular port. Um, so, you know, this could be go to this application to or this service to retrieve my menu. And then what Kubernetes will do is when that request comes into the service, uh, we'll distribute those incoming requests to the available pods uh, that belong to that service. And that's all attached together with the nodes and selectors uh, that Kubernetes allows. So you would tag your, your pods according to a service, and then the selector of that service determines which pods to route that request to. So this is kind of a quick way to think about it visually. Uh, you'll see in this, uh, this sort of cluster, we've got three different nodes running, so you know, three VMs that Kubernetes is running across, and then we've got two services, A and B. Um, there's an additional concept within Kubernetes of an ingress, which we talked about, which is the idea that this is the front door to my application, that is what, this is what is available outside the cluster. So in Drupal, this would be like the web service, right? So I come in, I type in www.drupalsite.org, from the internet, I go into the ingress controller of my Kubernetes cluster. And you can do all kinds of fancy path-based routing, but essentially the ingress controller is connecting a certain host name and path um, to a particular service. From there, Kubernetes is deciding everything on the bottom of the screen, right? It's deciding how many pods need to be available to support the resource needs of a particular service and what nodes to schedule them on. So again, in this quick example, we've got service B, which is using a little bit more of the available resources than service A. So we've got three pods supporting B and only two supporting A spread across three nodes. And that can change like throughout the life of an application in real time, right? It can change as a request is being made. Kubernetes is smart enough to say, well, node 2 is actually like experiencing a ton of traffic here. I need to move that pod's traffic onto node 3. And that happens, you know, completely obtusely to the person making the request or even you as the person kind of owning the application. Um, and again, it's all, it's all based on selectors defined in the service which indicate which pods to forward those requests to. And Kubernetes handles all of that underlying scheduling. Um, okay, I promise, almost done with the really dry stuff. Um, a deployment in Kubernetes simply means like what template do you use for each pod and that means like the resource allocations, you know, my service needs this much RAM, this much CPU, but I want to limit it to this much RAM and this much CPU and I only want those pods to run on these kinds of nodes, for example. Um, a, a job in Kubernetes is a special kind of pod that only runs for a short time and it only runs at a defined point in the application lifecycle and then terminates. That becomes important when we start talking about like how Drupal fits into this whole model, but a pod is essentially a worker that is deployed into the cluster to do one thing and then, and then you know, and remove itself. It's not actually designed to respond to requests coming in through services. Um, and then storage on Kubernetes is all handled by this idea of persistent volume claims, which is just as RAM and CPU are doled out to individual pods, you can create these PVCs, which are like slices of underlying storage. And it works exactly the same way, where nodes may provide, you know, X number of gigabytes of space. Those are all collected together into volumes, and then individual pods can claim, you know, a, a certain amount of that storage. Um, but the idea is it's completely abstracted, right? So you could have a, a NAS device attached to your cluster providing the storage, which is totally different than the, you know, machines that are running and providing your CPU and, and RAM on your nodes. Okay. Mm -hmm.
Uh, and again, you know, sorry about all this, but quickly, config maps are a kind of resource that uh, allow you to assign environment variables to containers, which is important to do things like, you know, share host names, uh, share, you know, usernames and things like that any configuration that you want to push into the Docker container. Um, and then finally, a secret is a kind of configuration that is, well, you know, secret. Uh, and it's encrypted so that if you need to commit passwords and things like that, uh, they aren't stored in plain text. All right, we're done. Everybody still with me? Good. So what does any of this have to do with Drupal, right? This is the question we all came here to hear about. Um, it's a good question. What are some of the benefits of running Drupal on Kubernetes? Um, First of all, you get seamless and consistent deployments, right? If you already utilize Docker containers for local development, you don't have to do anything else to sort of build out that infrastructure. You never have to worry that like PHP versions are gonna be different, that you have to maintain a whole separate set of chef cookbooks or Ansible playbooks to deploy your upstream architecture in a way that is different than what your developers are using locally because they're gonna be the exact same container images. Um, also, if Drupal has to run alongside other applications or services, uh, like if you've got a solar search engine that has to run, if you have a varnish cache that needs to sit in front of Drupal, if you've got Node.js web services that you are requesting things pulling into Drupal to serve via the CMS, you can put all of that on Kubernetes at the same time and not have to worry about maintaining separate infrastructure stacks. Um, and you get everything out of the box, right? Scaling, high availability, infrastructure as code is already baked into Kubernetes. No more worrying about individual VMs, operating systems, internal networking, et cetera, right? It's doing all of that under the hood. Um, and again, it's a totally cloud agnostic infrastructure because you can take a, a whole Kubernetes deployment from AWS, <coughs> shift it onto Azure, move it into an on-premises data center, it's all gonna run exactly the same. Um, on the other hand, why might you not want to run Drupal on Kubernetes? Um, it can be a difficult learning curve. As we're seeing, the vocabulary is very different, and it's a conceptually a different way of thinking about hosting applications, uh, especially in the cloud. Uh, especially if you don't have any kind of baked in container experience within your organization. That can be a difficult leap to begin with, and then making the additional uh, paradigm shift into Kubernetes. Um, it does involve some additional moving parts to make Drupal happy, right? Because as we talked about, like Drupal started life and lived most of its life as this monolith that existed on a single machine. And so even with Drupal 8, that's abstracted away a little bit, but you know, it's still in Drupal's DNA that it expects sort of everything to be available in one place. So it takes some special massaging to kind of allow Drupal to be happy in this loosely coupled stateless kind of infrastructure. Um, and again, it's, it's more of a mental paradigm shift uh, away from thinking of Drupal as a monolith that runs on a single server. Um, so what does Drupal look like in a service-oriented uh, uh, format, right? I would contend that basically you're looking at four core services that make up the Drupal experience at a minimum. Uh, and in addition, you're probably going to have several more living kind of in your Drupal ecosystem. Obviously, the first thing you need is a web server, right? Traditionally, that's been Apache uh, as kind of the driver for Drupal. Uh, more recently, we've seen a shift over to Nginx, uh, which is a lot faster and um, you know, has a number of other benefits. That's serving all of your static files, your style sheets, JavaScript, et cetera. Um, and then you've got the real heart of Drupal, which is PHP, and that's running all of your Symfony classes, everything that Drupal has to do to think about itself, make requests you know, to the database, assemble uh, pages and bits of content to send out via that web layer. So the request comes in from the internet into your web service, it then makes a request to PHP, and then finally PHP decides, well, what else do I need to put this request together, right? Almost certainly that means I have to go to my database. So there's a third service. I have to reach out to MySQL, run some queries, figure out, you know, where am I in the menu structure, what taxonomy terms are associated, et cetera. Run a bunch of node load commands, get back this big array, parse it, et cetera, send it back to the web. Um, and then finally, almost certainly, you need some kind of a file storage layer, whether that's just a bare volume that you're using, allowing people to upload images, PDFs, et cetera, into Drupal. Um, again, in a more cloud-oriented way, that's probably something like S3FS module, um, using an object store that's sitting behind Drupal as opposed to just a, a basic volume. Uh, I wanted to get into that a little bit more in this talk, but there's already kind of a lot going on here. But you know, the idea being you need something to store those files that aren't going to live in the database. Yeah, go ahead. I do want to ask really quickly, I know you're trying to get through a lot. Sure. About this whole idea of the, the external file store. Uh, and you said there's a little bit of massaging that you do with Drupal to make mm -hmm. it happy in this loosey couple thing. So 
look at the file source. That's something like basically what you're doing is you've got your site's default files, but that sim links to some type of other mount, and that mount is what connects to you then. Even though we think we're uploading the file and it's on the server where Drupal yep. sits, it ends up getting uploaded to S3. So to Drupal, it's still kind of transparent. It thinks it's doing its normal. Is that what ends up happening? Exactly, okay. yeah. And actually, I think if you look back at uh, this diagram here, it can um, you know help out a little bit. If we consider maybe you know service B to be the PHP service here, so the requests are coming in to A, which is the web service, which is making the request to B. Um, it is then going to send that request to one of these pods on one of these nodes, right? But if that request is to upload a file, for example, or even to you know to pull one out via Drupal, uh, those thought, those objects, right? What you're trying to access has to be available on every node that that container is running on, right? So immediately that's a paradigm shift away okay. from Drupal's running on a single server and uh, I, I know I'm gonna have stuff under site's default files that's gonna be available to me, right? Because it's not in this situation. It's not on the uh, container image um, that you know is being deployed because it has to be dynamic. So you can do that one of two ways. Um, you can either define a persistent volume claim in Kubernetes and mount that on you know, essentially each of these nodes. Uh, not to get too deeply into it, but that depends on what the underlying storage class is. If you're using something like EFS in Amazon, where you can do read-write from multiple servers, uh, that can work right out of the box. But if you're using a block store as your back end, um, that's not going to work as well precisely because you need it to be mountable, rewrite from each of these nodes, right? So it introduces this layer of complexity. Um, I think that is most elegantly solved by something like S3FS, which gets rid of the whole idea of files and block store completely and uses this object-based store so that all of your files end up going into S3. And what that does is it takes over the file stream wrapper layer within Drupal. So it's not even talking to that site's default files at all. Like everything is going out to the S3 API and coming back in that way. Minio is exactly what I was about to mention, yeah, which is uh, Minio, for those of you not familiar, is an open source S3 API, which you can run in a container. Um, and I, I'm not going to show that configuration today, but uh, the application that I took all of this from does use Minio as its underlying S3 source. And you can just drop it into any application, install S3FS module. It works as a Kubernetes service just right out of the box. Uh, okay, so we talked about that. Um, and again, you're probably going to have other services running you know, alongside Drupal, right? You probably have something like Varnish to provide caching for your public traffic. You probably need some kind of a mail gateway if you're sending out any kind of email, like a post fix. Um, you probably need a test driver, like a BHAT, Selenium machine to run your functional tests against. Uh, if you're doing any kind of search, you most likely need like a Solar or Elasticsearch. The idea is, though, that all of these can run in containers. They can all run on Kubernetes. You don't need to worry about deploying different infrastructure for all the services that Drupal needs to run alongside. So how does that, what we just looked at, translate into the Kubernetes resource primitives that we were talking about earlier, right? Well, obviously, we're going to need uh, deployments, which are you know, pod or container templates for each of the, the main three services, the Nginx, PHP, and MySQL. Uh, and then we need a service definition for each of those as well, which defines what port they run on, which pods to connect the, the service request to. And then, again, as we were just saying, we either need a persistent volume claim for shared file storage, if that's supported by the underlying storage engine, which is a key point here, or alternatively, another service like Minio, which is providing S3 compatible storage. So you don't have to think about volumes or block store or anything like that at all. Um, finally, we need an ingress rule, which is routing connections on incoming ports to the web service, which is typically 80 and 443. And ingress in Kubernetes will happily handle all of your SSL termination, so you don't need to worry about deploying your certificates to each of your web pods, for example. You can have the request come in HTTPS 443 into your ingress, and then the ingress can relay the request, because ingress is essentially just an Nginx reverse proxy in and of itself. It relays that request or proxies it into your web service on port 80 or an arbitrary port number, again, behind the Kubernetes network wall uh, without any kind of um, SSL, uh, which is great because you, know, you can not have to worry about any kind of that configuration. Um, finally, we need a job to uh, run post-deploy tasks, right? So if you think about a Drupal deployment process, you push everything out to your server, and then there's like other stuff that needs to be done to bring the database up to date with the code you just deployed. So it's probably running a bunch of Drush commands, like clear cache, feature revert if you're running a Drupal 7, config import, uh, you know, enable modules, et cetera. So that would be the use case for a Kubernetes job. 
Uh, and then finally, like a config map for environment variables um, and a secret file for the passwords, in particular the database password. Uh, yeah, as we were just saying, what does a Drupal to Kubernetes build and deploy process look like? First of all, you know, if we're starting from a base uh, code base and we're using best practices uh, with Composer, we need to install all of our dependencies, which is usually a matter of running like Composer install. Those shouldn't be committed into your Git. If you're committing your, all your um, Composer dependencies into Drupal, you're probably not in compliance with the best practice. Um, once that's done, we probably need to do some work on our style sheets, which compiles like SAS or SCSS into CSS using something like Gulp or Grunt, which again would be a, a case for another container here. Um, we then need to, once all those files are in place, we need to build our container images for our PHP, Nginx, and MySQL services, push all of those uh, built images into a Docker container registry, then we deploy all of our Kubernetes resources via those YAML files into a cluster. Uh, and the kind of the most basic way to do that is with our kubectl command. Uh, and then finally, we do the migration, we run all of the database updates, we enable modules, et cetera, as we were just talking about with Drush. And then as a final step, run our automated functional test using a framework like BHAT. So that seems hard, right? Like that's a lot of stuff to take care of. How can we make this at least a little bit easier? Um, don't panic. I, I think we actually have some tools that, that uh, help, us, help us out a little bit. Um, first of all, we have the cloud now, which I think is going to be really useful uh, because we can have managed Kubernetes services that handle all that heavy lifting, creating, configuring, scaling a cluster, dealing with nodes, etc. You can run Amazon Kubernetes service, Azure, you know, Google Cloud. These all already exist. We don't need to be doing that heavy lifting ourselves. And all of them you know, now come with container registries and CI pipelines built in. So we don't need to be spinning up Jenkins servers. We don't need to be worrying about where's my container registry going to live, etc. This is all sort of like baked into the cake if you're deploying into one of these cloud providers. No need to manage that extra infrastructure. Um, even still though, right, managing all those YAML files still seems kind of cumbersome, um, which is why I find the easiest way to actually get a Kubernetes application up into a cluster is using a tool called Helm. Uh, again, this is kind of a uh, part of the, the nautical reference, Kubernetes, meaning like navigator. Uh, Helm is sort of the, you know, the, the tool that the navigator uses, right? Um, and to, to extend that further, Helm uses this concept of charts, which are logical groupings of Kubernetes uh, resources together that allow you to um, you know, deploy an application up into a cluster. So you can think of it as an intelligent package manager, right? It's like apt or yum for Linux packages, like homebrew for Mac pack, pack, packages. Uh, it goes and grabs everything you need, all of the container images, and kind of logically pushes those into a cluster. Um, it handles all the deployment of the resources within a chart, uh, and most importantly, manages failure, right? So you can say, Helm, deploy this chart. It grabs all of the YAML files that are associated with it, pushes them into a cluster, and if one of them fails, you can define rollback rules, right? So if my MySQL service doesn't end up deploying into Kubernetes because I messed up the Docker file or whatever, uh, it's not gonna bother deploying the rest of my application because I know it's not gonna work without that dependency. Quick yeah, sure. Use like Helm for the initial deployment, or use like every time you want to deploy something. You can use it every time. Um, and actually, yeah, I think I've got that next, right? So what can Helm do? It basically consists of a command line client, which is called Helm, and a server called Tiller. I don't quite know how that works with the nautical theme, but uh, Tiller runs inside Kubernetes inside a container, which keeps track of your application state and it manages resources within your cluster, right? So you can Helm install the name of a chart. It installs everything to the cluster. It then makes changes and push additional uh, Docker images to your registry. You can say Helm update, and it will intelligently figure out what images have I updated in my registry, what do I actually need to update in the cluster, and again, manage that entire process. Then you can list the active applications that are running, and of course it uses kind of the, the funny Docker animal names to give each application uh, instance name. You can get the status on an individual instance, whether it deployed correctly, whether it needs to be rolled back, and finally you can delete everything associated with a Helm chart at the same time. And that's probably the, one of the primary use cases, right? Because if you just deploy 25 different YAML files into Kubernetes and then you want to roll back, like writing the shell scripts to figure out where all of those went, what are the dependencies between them, I want to make sure they're all gone, can be like super cumbersome. So Helm handles all that for you. Um, 
And again, if you just want a turnkey solution, there is a public Helm chart available for Drupal. So you can go right to the github.com slash Helm and find it in there. And the easiest way is just to do Helm install stable slash Drupal. And then as presuming you've got your you know, Kubernetes cluster all set up, um, it's literally all you need to be done. Where's the fun in that, right? Like, why would we want things to be super easy? Um, so I'll take probably just five more minutes here, walk through what a Helm chart looks like, uh, and then see if we can get everybody out of here. So let's look at some code, see what we're actually getting into with Helm. Um, some prerequisites to this we don't have a lot of time for would be, you know, I'm assuming you already have some kind of Drupal environment based on Docker containers. Uh, we have one that we develop at Mavomo called Drupal Stand. Uh, we're a little bit biased, but it's a highly opinionated environment. You can check it out, github.com slash Drupal Stand. Um, there are uh, tons of other ones out there, Docsol, Lando, Docker for Drupal, DDEV, et cetera. These are all very opinionated. That's a great thing. There should be lots of them. Figure out which one works best for you and then tweak it. And then obviously you need a container registry and a Kubernetes cluster to run it on. And some kind of tooling, which can just be a matter of shell scripts, you know, Jenkins jobs, whatever, Azure pipeline, to build and push those containers into your registry. Um, what does a Helm chart look like? Uh, this is pretty similar to like a composer.json, a package, you know, .yaml file if you're using some other kind of framework. Your chart YAML file defines the chart name, description, and version of what's in the chart, and that's it. You have a requirements.yaml that is a list of other charts that are required to run that chart. So this is an easy way to make things modular so that, for example, you don't have to define what a deployment for a MySQL service looks like. All you have to do is say that the Drupal chart depends on the MySQL chart. Um, and then each chart also has a collection of Kubernetes templates, which are YAML files that it will deploy into the cluster, as well as values.yaml, which are like environment-specific variables you can insert into those templates. And I think it's the end of the slides. I did just want to show a couple of things here. Um, I don't know if you can see this kind of folders area here on the left-hand side, but this, uh, the idea here is we've got one chart for um, Drupal GovCon Helm, which is just name, description, you know, and version from chart.yaml. Under requirements, uh, we're listing three additional charts, database, application, which is PHP, and web. And under repository, as a requirement, you can either list a local file, uh, which will be included in that same repo, or you list like a name of a public Helm chart, which you can then go out and grab. And then you list the containers associated with it. Um, and for each of these, I don't want to walk through all of them. Maybe we'll just go through web, for example. Um, on the underlying chart, you've got the same thing. The chart.yaml, requirements uh, or dependencies, which in this case is nothing, and then values uh, to insert into it. So. Values might be things like, for example, the Docker uh, container registry you're pulling the container images from, the name of that registry, the tag you want to use, and you know whether you always want to pull a fresh version of the image. And then on a um, sort of pod by pod basis, you define what resources should be available to, to this container when it deploys. So like, what, are, what is my minimum CPU and RAM I want to make available? And then what are the maximum, right? Like where should I limit the resource consumption of that service? Um, and then under uh, templates is where you've got all of your Kubernetes resources. Uh, and again, these are just YAML files using some of these variables, right? So this is a deployment that defines my web pods that are going out. I define a node selector, which is what nodes to assign them to. Uh, I define various labels that are attached to it. And then finally I say, use this container image here, um, make it available on this port. Um, you know, and start the container with this argument. All of my environment variables I already defined in my values file and then the resources which we just saw. So again, this is all very simple YAML syntax. I know it might look, not look that way for people who are not familiar, but so much easier than actually writing a DSL or some kind of like esoteric, you know, script to make all this available. It's very simple declarative syntax. Um, and if we were to look at like the PHP container, again, very similar here. We define like what resources are available to it, what environment variables should be injected into the container, and here it would be something like the you know, MySQL host name, which is just the name of the service, because Kubernetes does all of our DNS for us, the user, database name, and password. We had mentioned briefly um, Kubernetes secrets, which are just another kind of resource. So you define a secret as this is something I want to be available to the rest of my cluster. It's encrypted, so nobody gets to know what my database password is. It's Drupal, don't tell anybody. 
but I can commit this file right into my repository, and that secret is kept safe. It's all you know uh, encrypted with a pre-shared key. Kubernetes knows that key, so it grabs this secret, deploys it as an environment variable into my container, and that is shared by the deployment of the database is using that secret, as well as the um, as well as the PHP container, because it's all going to be in the same Kubernetes namespace. So. All right, I know that's a lot. I tried to rush through a little bit at the end. Uh, I, I cheated a little bit on my David S. Pumpkin slide, but <laughs> questions. Yeah. Uh, so the question, if you have like, a, I have two questions. If you have like a small web server, and you want just to need your like a personal site, mm -hmm. uh, does it make sense to use like a single node Kubernetes cluster mm -hmm. or Docker Compose? And another question, uh, okay, go ahead. Sure. Uh, yes. Yeah, so the question is like, if you've got just a small personal site, does it make, yeah. make sense to use single node Kubernetes or Docker Compose? What I would say is that you get a lot of the failover aspects of Kubernetes. Even if you're running a single node, if that node does fail, um, you can you know seamlessly just allow your site to transition to a new one, for example, right? Whereas with Docker Compose, it's still stateful in the sense that if that machine goes down, you lose all of your Docker Compose state along with it, whereas Kubernetes is going to retain that. Um, Docker Compose also has some limitations in terms of the internal networking and some things that get weird, which is not to say it's a bad tool. I think it's incredibly useful, again, for, for small situations, but you're still managing the underlying resources with that. You've got to deploy some kind of a VM, install Docker on it, you know, make sure it's got all those dependencies, and then if something happens to the machine, you've got to kind of do that all over again, whereas Kubernetes, I think, takes another step back from that and abstracts it, you know, uh, a further layer. Um, but, you know, we use Docker Compose for tons of, like, even local applications, because it's super easy to spin up a bunch of containers on your local machine, so. Got it. Uh, so the question number two, yep. does it make sense to build Docker images before you deploy, like, every time, or... You just build it once and then you reuse it over and over again. Um, I mean, in theory, Docker should determine that for you, right? So if you've got, if you made changes to your Docker file or to any of the underlying files that it's putting into your container image, um, if you run Docker build, it'll only do the build if you've made those changes. Otherwise, it'll just compare the SHA of one container to the previous one, and it'll say, I don't have to do anything here. So it's typically a good idea to put a Docker build line in your CI script. It's not going to do extra work if it doesn't need to, basically. But you can be surprised. Like, if you make a change to a config file that's like three layers down in your folder structure, you might have forgotten about that and forget to run the update, and then suddenly the bug you thought you fixed isn't fixed. Whereas if you just run Docker build every time, it can make sure and, and capture that. And that's also a use case for tagging your images every time, whether that's just with like the commit SHA or a sequential version number or timestamp or whatever, because then if you're pushing that into your Helm chart, Helm knows like, oh, this has been updated. I need to go out and grab version 2.1.99 or whatever. Yeah. Um, you know, and, and it just does that kind of automatically rather than you having to know like, oh right, I have to update this particular image. So does it like a CI CD needs to also update the Helm file? to uh, like update the versions of this Docker container? It depends on how you do tagging. Uh, if you just like tag it with latest, for example, and you leave that in your Helm chart, it's always going to grab the one with latest. So if you just do the Docker build and push to that tag, it'll grab the new image. Um, there is, uh, well, I don't know if I can show it easily here. Um, there's this value called image pull policy. Um, which is right here under container. So I'm saying for this pod, I want to run my DB container. Here's the image name, which is either this registry, this name, this tag. And then image pull policy is something like always, never, or if needed, which is basically do, when do I go out to the registry to fetch a new one, right? It's either all the time I'm, I'm checking, or I don't really care, or I'm going to look at the tags and make sure the SHAs match. And if they don't, then I'm going to grab a new one. Yeah. So we're, we're running very, very similar project, mm -hmm. charts, video, uh, whatnot, and uh, one of the benefits is, as opposed to using like a dev desktop, Docker Mac, running yep. Kubernetes, and then apart from having installed Helm and charts into ourselves, mm -hmm. then we're now verbatim with wherever's running. Um, can you maybe talk a little bit about uh, you know, how that falls in line then with configuration management, maybe with, with Drupal, like yeah. so you've got YAML files and so either for staging purposes and or maintenance testing variations mm -hmm. of, maybe you can talk a little bit about that. I'm not sure if that's how you guys work at well. Sure. Yeah, no, uh, and that's actually, I think, one of the advantages of, of this whole process is that you can sort of build an instance of the site 
regardless of content by combining your Helm charts with your Drupal configuration. So I'm spinning up a new, you know, as part of my CI process, I'm creating a new instance of this application every time. I am spinning up new container images, you know, all of my Kubernetes rules, etc. And I then also, as my, my post install job, that's actually one of the things I, I kind of forgot to mention, is in these job templates. Um, so I've got one here for site install, one for site update under my application container. And Helm has a hook system that's very similar to um, you know, what, what Drupal uses actually, where you can tag jobs to specific points in the deploy cycle. So I can say on post upgrade, so after I've finished upgrading containers in an existing uh, namespace, I'll run this job. And this one you know, just as an example of a, a shell script, but within this script I would run drush commands to do things like config import, you know, database update, etc. Um, so I think you can actually combine it in such a way that you, you don't have to worry about what the content is in the production database as long as you've got something like a, a default content module, for example, and spin everything up from code without having to worry about, oh, I need to go out to this artifact repository, grab this SQL dump, and import it every time. Um, I'm very much of the opinion that like configuration should go up and content should you know, flow down, essentially. Um, but more and more recently, what I'm seeing is that as long as you have a good test engineer, that's important, who can create you know, content uh, that uh, essentially encapsulates all of your test cases, you put that all in code, you can deploy it into these environments every time, you don't need to worry about moving the SQL dumps around, right? So I think we're kind of moving more and more in that direction. Sometimes it's, you know, it, it never quite works perfectly, right? Because somebody will have a problem on one particular page that it's one particular thing in a really screwed up way that you can't really replicate. And then it's just a matter of saying like, hey, Eduardo, we need you to, you know, write a better test for that. So I think we're moving rapidly toward that kind of world. Not quite there yet, but these are the, the tools that allow that to happen. But yeah, Drupal 8 config import export is like a lifesaver on some And the YAML file for configuration management is sort of key, I guess, because mm -hmm. that, that allows you to not have to rebuild additional types of Kubernetes clusters or error. If you want to write slight variations off a Drupal distribution, for example, I guess your YAML configuration can have some of these variances without, if you don't need to completely separate code, mm -hmm. it's just, well, yeah, exactly, and that's so one of the things Helm can do is with this values file, you can have multiple ones of these, right? You can have values production, values local, values staging, and then when you run your, uh, your Helm install, I don't think it's on here, but you can just say Helm install this chart dash dash values equals and give it a values file. So all of those can be different, like if I wanted to run uh, even different container images, although that's probably not recommended, but like if I, if I know that in you know, my dev environment, I only need like 10% of a CPU and 250 megs of RAM to run my database, but in production I need like six gigs of RAM, I can just make this resource is different in my two values files and deploy them selectively that way. So that's pretty powerful when combined with the way you can um, just drop these, you know, these uh, arbitrary values into your Kubernetes templates. So I think it gives you almost too much flexibility sometimes and thinking about like, well, what's the difference between like an environment and an instance and things like that, but these are good problems to have, I think. Right. How does the help work with, uh, in case the deployment uh, failed and you need to revert uh, changes, what do you need to do in the help work? Uh, yeah, you can basically handle failure however you want, right? So what it'll say is if you were to run Helm list, for example, and a deployment failed because, let's say, a, um, there's some Drupal error when you're importing content, which is like the most common reason I find deployments fail. So there's some weird thing in Drupal where there's an order of operations error and one module is enabled before another or something like that. The, the Kubernetes job fails, which causes the Helm deployment to fail. So then if you were to do Helm list, it would say this you know, individual deployment failed. You can then determine whether you roll back, which is like remove all of the resources I just deployed, uh, or if you want to leave everything in state so I can look at logs and see exactly why it's broken. But you would define that in all of your Helm you know, hooks within the deployment. Um, and Kubernetes can do different things in terms of like rolling deployments, whether it like updates one running pod at a time to ensure that one is always available, or if it takes them all offline and pushes everything out at once and things like that. It's, it's very configurable. Can, yep. can you drill a little bit into like the database side of this? So you have what, some kind of shared volume that you're tapping into, or what does that look like? Yeah, and that's, that is one of the, I think, more challenging things to do with Kubernetes is figuring out how to scale applications that require persistent storage that needs read-write access. So here um, in this uh, deployment for the database, I'm just doing a persistent volume claim 
uh, that's linked or mounted essentially under Varlid MySQL. Uh, and under the, the PVC um, deployment or, or the, the resource file for this, I'm basically saying, you know, whatever, this is a five gig file system um, and I'm setting it as read write once, which essentially means that I can only have one pod running for this database. So this is actually not a highly available configuration. What you would want to do is set access mode to read write multiple, which means that multiple pods can all write to the same shared volume. Problem with that is you need an underlying storage engine that can handle that, right? So you couldn't use like Elastic Block Store on Amazon because a block store by definition can only be attached to a single machine at a time. If you were to run like Elastic File System, you can do it that way. Um, so that's, that's what involves some thinking through of this and you need a, a, an underlying storage technology that can scale along with the amount of, of pods across different nodes that you're going to have attaching to it. Um, what we've typically done, honestly, in, in production environments is still rely on a managed cloud service for something like database. So to use like an RDS, Aurora, you know, DB instance, or a, a Azure, you know, MySQL database. Uh, given that those can scale vertically a lot more efficiently than we could scale horizontally with something like Kubernetes. Um, you certainly can run databases in it. I would say it's not the best use case, given that the you know, cloud providers give you a lot of options for that. Of course, the disadvantage is it's not as portable, right? Because you'd have to write a separate configuration outside of Kubernetes for the database endpoint and you know, the resources for that. So. But in this instance, we do have it in a container mm -hmm. here. Yeah, no, it, it absolutely can be done. Um, and, you know, this I pulled out of an application that, you know, just didn't have a lot of database traffic because it was kind of protected by a caching layer. So we found that having a single pod running, because Kubernetes can still make things highly available with a single pod. It just means that you risk some downtime if it has to move it from one node to another. The underlying storage doesn't change, but the actual, like, the MySQL service might have a few seconds where it's unavailable moving from one to the other. Everything heals itself. All of the endpoints and the DNS and everything change kind of in the background. You don't have to redeploy, but you're, you're trading in a little bit less stability for you know, a situation where you don't have to go and have an external database running, for example. And then in this situation, we didn't have access to like EFS or, or something like that, on the, or um, uh, Gluster, I guess, or some kind of shared file system. We were on an Elastic Block Store. Yep. Um, I was curious, like, what happens during that self-healing? Like, so if, if you get a page request, mm -hmm. all of a sudden the database is like dumping itself out of this uh, out of this node and loading itself into that node. Yeah. Does it just come uh, database not found, or is it, um, how does does Kubernetes try to handle any of this at all? Or oh yeah. It's going to try to handle it as fast as it can. That's not always instantaneous, right? So it could be a few you know, seconds, a few minutes, but I think it's going to look for the best place to put that resource. And if all of your, you know, your nodes are clustered together like on the same subnet, that's probably a quick process because it's not moving all the data over. It's using the same volume, but it does have to boot up a new container. So you're dealing with five or 10 seconds to bring it up. Um, so yeah, I think it would depend on where it exactly is at that process. But you'd probably get a DNS lookup failure for that service, or it would try to connect and fail. It wouldn't get the MySQL, but then probably in the span of hitting reload on that Drupal page, it would have healed itself. Again, though, some environments you know, require zero downtime, in which case I would say either use a managed database service for this, or you know, use a, a volume backend that actually supports multiple rewrite connections, and then you can scale out horizontally with your Cool. So, I mean, touching on that, so you're kind of like decomposing Drupal here, right? Mm -hmm. These different pieces, right? So, if, what's, what are those, you know, we talk about the database, that's kind of a pain point here. And then in terms of the user sessions and the fact on end users, yep. what's the other part? Is it the, the web front end or is it more the PHP in terms of session management? So you, yeah, you need to have an authoritative store for your sessions, which I think at Drupal 8, it does store them by default in the database. So if you just leave that set, it's always going to go back to MySQL to, to look up that session ID. Um, you could replace that for performance with something like Redis, for example. And you can run Redis on you know, Kubernetes and, and configure it to share all of its keys. Again, you sacrifice a little bit of... Uh, the delta in terms of how quickly it takes one key entering into a single Redis pod to you know, end up on all the others. Um, but it's still going to be faster than going all the way to the database to grab that session ID. But what you can't do is have the session stored on the, um, 
the web server or the PHP application server itself. That was the way Drupal 7 would do it by default. So anytime you're running Drupal 7 on anything other than a single machine, you have to switch the session store to actually use the, the database, which you know I think was a, an initial conceptual hurdle we had to get past when we started doing like load balancing for Drupal to begin with. Can you run the crush command to, let's say, flush all uh, varnish uh, in the mm -hmm. for, for all um, running pods? And how, how would I do this? Yeah. Well, again, it would just be um, it would just be connecting to a varnish service, um, mm -hmm. and Kubernetes would handle like what pod that actually ends up on. I don't. Off the top of my head, I don't know how Varnish would handle that, but it would be internal to that application. I do know it's possible. I think it, rather than storing everything, actually, I think you could probably do it either way. You can either have all of your Varnish pods use a single volume for its cache store, yeah. or store them all in the, um, you know, the internal store for the pod, and they would just, whatever Varnish pod you connected to, you would get the cache that's hot in that particular mm -hmm. pod, and then if it doesn't exist in that pod, it would have to go back to origin. So it kind of depends on your caching strategy and how you want to configure Varnish. But. And can you like, run the command that talks to all service, or it just talks to this, like, any service using the wrong drawdown or something like this? Um, you mean for, for Varnish in particular? Yeah, like if, can, can you do like, tell all like, Varnish images to flush the cache? Oh yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, you would have to, I don't know if you could do that from Drush by default. You might have to do a little bit of magic on the Kubernetes layer to, to say that, but I would honestly say that if I, were, if I were running a high availability varnish on Kubernetes, I would probably just configure it to use a single volume for its store so that no matter which pod the flush request came into, it would just flush it out for, for everything. But I could see that working either way depending on what your cache priorities are, basically. Thank you. So. Cool, yeah. So if I wanted to push out updated code to my cluster, what would that process look like? Is it like building a new container image? Is it going down the existing containers? Uh, yeah, you would, you would build a new container image. Um, I would kind of use this as an example. Like your, your CI pipeline, so say you pushed a new update either to your config or to a new PHP file into your repository. Your CI process notices that. It's going to go through this list of things. It'll you know, run Composer for you, grab the dependencies, compile your style sheets, build a new image, right? And then push that out with a particular tag into your container registry. And then the, the additional thing you would do would be to run like Helm Update, for example, which would tell Kubernetes, go out and grab that new container image I just posted, do a rolling deployment, push it out to all my pods, and then run whatever Drush commands I need to do. So it does require some additional tooling to kind of get these steps checked off, but I think once you have that in place, it's all end-to-end -end within a couple minutes that you've got from commit to it's all the way on the environment, it's run the config update, and everything's back in place. So you can do some cool stuff with it, for sure. Have you heard about Rancher, and is it helpful if you run it together with Helm and uh, Kubernetes. I have not heard about running Rancher and Helm together because I think doesn't Rancher use a different container uh, runtime? It does. It doesn't use Docker, right? It doesn't use. Um, I, I'm yeah. I'm honestly oh, okay. not sure. I've, I've played around with it a little yeah. bit. I've never actually used it in production, but yeah, it'd be worth looking into. Well, I think the, the point to be made is that Kubernetes doesn't actually depend on Docker itself. You can run a number of container runtimes underneath it. Docker is by far the most common one, um, but it's, it's not necessarily required. It's, you know, Kubernetes is agnostic about what type of containers you're using underneath it. So. All right, we're a little few minutes over, but thank you everybody for coming out. And hope you have a great, great time.